Disney and Marvel Studios have long lamented the YouTuber that has been discussing things like, well, Disney's a mess. Marvel's a mess. We've heard this and that. But now that long lamented YouTuber has been vindicated in large respects by none other than Variety Magazine itself. With a crisis at Marvel and the Marvel's reshoots, the Jonathan Major's backup plans, reviving the original Avengers and more issues revealed. Well, buckle up, folks, because pretty much everything we've been telling you the last couple of years was right. Well, folks, welcome back. Another great day here at Valiant Renegade. It's good to see everybody out there once again. And if you are like one of the many folks watching this video, not yet subscribed to this channel, please take a moment and turn that little red subscribe button to gray. Hit that like button. Hit that notification bell. Share this sucker out on the social medias. And of course, please do leave a comment before you head out the door today. Make sure to join us every Sunday afternoon at 6 p.m. Eastern for the live show. Now, before we go into the article, I want to commend the artist that did this bit for this story in Variety because nothing could be more perfect, starting with The Incredible Hulk back in 2008, and then up the ladder they climbed with Captain America, Black Widow, Spider-Man, Iron Man, of course, and Doctor Strange. This led all the way through to the end of Phase 3 in Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. And of course, since then, what have we been left with? Well, a hodgepodge of everything else. Captain Marvel, Ant-Man falling apart, the Anthony Mackie Captain America movie, and then, of course, Loki and She-Hulk. One might be forgiven for imagining the rise and fall of the Roman Empire with this one. The annual Marvel Studios personnel retreat is usually a very festive occasion. This year was anything but. This occasion was angst-ridden, according to Variety magazine. Everyone at Marvel was reeling from a series of disappointments on screen, a legal scandal involving one of its biggest stars, and questions about the viability of the studio's ambitious strategy to extend the brand beyond movies and into streaming. The most pressing issue to be discussed at the retreat was what to do about Jonathan Majors, the actor who had been poised to carry the next phase of the MCU, but instead is headed to a high-profile trial in New York later this month on domestic violence charges. The actor insists that he is the victim, but the damage to his reputation and the chance he could lose the case has forced Marvel to reconsider its plans to center the next phase of its interlocking slate of sequels, spinoffs, and series around Majors, villainous character Kang the Conqueror. At the gathering in Palm Springs, the executives discussed their backup plans, including pivoting to another adversary like Doctor Doom, but making any shift would carry its own headaches. Majors was already a big presence in the MCU, including as the scene-stealing antagonist in February's Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, and he has been positioned as the franchise's next big thing in this season of Loki, particularly with the finale, which will air on November 9th. That's a day after the Walt Disney Company earnings call, folks. And then, of course, there is the titular problem of the next Avengers film, which, well... Is Kang. One of the unexpected benefits of the poor performance of Marvel Phases 4 and 5 is that it makes this change a little bit easier. They didn't get anywhere near the size of the audience that they got through Infinity War and Endgame, so frankly, a lot of people probably have never seen Kang, never heard of Kang, and probably won't care or even realize that this character is getting replaced. It's not as if Loki Season 1 really lit the fire in the streaming side of things. Sure, it was one of the biggest things on Disney+, Plus, but one of the biggest things on Disney+, Plus is still mediocre tier-level viewership when you compare it to its competitors like Netflix. And as far as Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania goes, well, virtually nobody saw that. The movie couldn't even break half a billion worldwide. Now, granted, I know that's still a big number, but when it comes to major Disney films with $300 million costs attached to just producing a film like that, that's a real problem. Marvel is truly <clears throat> screwed with the whole Kang angle, says one top dealmaker who has seen the final Loki episode. Quote, and they haven't had an opportunity to rewrite until very recently because of the WGA strike, but I don't see a path to how they move forward with him. Beyond the bad press for majors, the brain trust at Marvel is also grappling with the November release of The Marvels, a sequel to 2019's blockbuster Captain Marvel that has been plagued with lengthy reshoots and now appears likely to underwhelm at the box office. 
Lo and behold, yet more confirmation that the Marvels was, again, reshot. Now, we knew this months ago when they initially moved it off its block following the opening weekend, very bad opening weekend, I might add, of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania back in March of 2023. Originally, the Marvels was supposed to premiere in theaters in July, the same weekend that Haunted Mansion came out. It was pushed back to November, which was Haunted Mansion's old slot, and they are not expecting much from this, and yet another movie that will cost the Walt Disney Company, when all said and done, over $300 million just to produce, and that's before they spend a dime marketing the damn thing. The problem, of course, is that Disney was incapable of recognizing that the character of Captain Marvel was never a thing. The only reason that the first movie back in 2019 did what it did was because it was slotted in at the last minute, a very rough shoehorn job right there, two months before Endgame was released. Anything, anything at all with the Marvel logo on it in that slot before the biggest movie of all time came out, or one of them at least, was going to do very well. If Disney had, instead of the box office, paid attention to things like merchandise sales and actual fan reaction and interest to Captain Marvel, they probably would have had a much better metric of whether or not to proceed with a sequel. Now, the article goes on to talk about the heyday of Marvel and when it was box office dominant, everything a guaranteed success virtually, to where we are now. And according to a Wall Street analyst named Eric Handler, he says the Marvel machine was pumping out a lot of content. Did it get to the point where there was just too much and they were burning people out on superheroes? It's possible. The more you do, the tougher it is to maintain quality. And they tried to experiment with breaking in some new characters like Shang-Chi and the Eternals with mixed results. With budgets as big as these, you need home runs. Well, who's been telling you that for the last couple of years? Now, while I agree with him on the box office side, I take a little issue with the whole superhero fatigue mindset. Again, I think this is more of a problem of just bad movie fatigue because every one of these things in phases four and five, with maybe one exception or two, has just been awful. The article continues talking about the problems of the filming of the Marvels itself. And of course, we covered some of the news and the interview from Nia DaCosta, the director of the Marvels. And of course, during that interview, Nia DaCosta made some very stark revelations, things that frankly, we all knew going into it. But the first time we actually heard a director of one of these films say it out loud, it wasn't Nia DaCosta's movie. It was Kevin Feige's movie. Nia DaCosta seemed to indicate that she felt little more than a decoration on the whole production. Eyebrows raised even further when DaCosta began working on another film while the Marvels was still in post. The filmmaker moved to London earlier this year to begin prepping for her Tessa Thompson drama, Hedda. If you're directing a $250 million movie, it's really about 300. It's kind of weird for the director to leave with a few months to go, says a source familiar with the production. You think? And even more interesting, in June, Marvel, which traditionally only solicits feedback from Disney employees and their friends and families, took the uncharacteristic step of holding a public test screening in Texas. The audience gave the film middling reviews. And the reason Disney traditionally only uses Disney employees and their families is because it's easier to control them. You see, you don't want the whole plot getting out before the movie releases, but in this case, well, it actually did happen with the Marvels. But Marvel has never been in the business of being average. Quote, Kevin's real superpower, his genius has always been in post-production and getting his hands on movies and making sure they're finished strongly, the source adds. These days, he's spread thin. Marvel's entire VFX or visual effects battalion, including staffers and vendors, is struggling to keep pace with the never-ending stream of productions. This past February, when the credits rolled at the world premiere of Quantumania, shock rippled through the Regency Village Theater in Westwood over some shoddy CGI. Quote, there were at least 10 scenes where the visual effects had been added at the last minute and were out of focus, says one veteran power broker who was there. It was insane. I've never seen something like that in my entire career. Everyone was talking about it. Even the kids of the executives were talking about it. And if you'll recall, not that long ago, we were talking about articles and information that was coming out on places like Reddit and other social media platforms from visual effects engineers working for major Hollywood studios. And the one that they hated working for the most, according to them, was Marvel. Marvel was a complete disaster inside with a chaotic production schedule, constant reshoots because of poor upfront pre-production planning, and it left VFX houses working 16-hour days in some cases with no overtime pay, which, of course, 
is why we saw Marvel's VFX artists or Disney's VFX artists altogether recently apply for unionization. The schedule swamp with the Marvels had left the Ant-Man sequel in a squeeze, pushing up post-production schedule by four and a half months. Marvel films are known for coming down to the wire, given Feige's ability to, quote, foam the runway and land a plan that way, says one executive familiar with how that company operates. But this level of unfinished was unprecedented and would be noted in scathing reviews when the tentpole with the $200 million budget opened 11 days after the premiere. Yeah, you can forget 200. That thing was closer to 300, if not more. We'll find out soon enough when the final financial reporting drops in the UK in the next 12 months or so. Disney's top brass, including newly returned CEO Bob Iger, was said to be apoplectic about Marvel's VFX troubles. One month after the Quantumania premiere debacle, the guillotine fell on Victoria Alonso, who oversaw the studio's physical production, post-production, VFX, and animation. Now, as Hollywood folks like Script Doctor have pointed out a number of times, nobody, nobody else at any other studio held the title that Victoria Alonso had, basically overseeing everything at Marvel. It seemed like, and we speculated months ago, that she was set up to fail because it was only maybe a year or so before she was fired that she was given this lengthy title. You see, usually at Hollywood Studios, you'll have somebody in charge of physical production, and you'll have another person in charge of post-production and VFX, and maybe another person still in charge of animation. Victoria Alonso had everything thrown on her back, and as we speculated some time back, that was probably because somebody needed to fall on the sword whose name wasn't Kevin Feige. Now, to be clear, I'm not dismissing Victoria Alonso's problem-creating nature at Marvel for years. And certainly she needed to go, but we all know what happened behind the scenes because nobody was willing, I don't think even Disney's top brass was willing, to point the finger at Kevin Feige because getting rid of Kevin Feige at that point in time probably would have looked bad on Disney's part, even though we knew it's the right thing to do. While the reason cited for her abrupt firing was her unauthorized role as an executive producer on Oscar-nominated film Argentina, insiders say that Disney was incensed that the quality control on its Marvel productions was plummeting, particularly on the ever-expanding TV front. The VFX logjam had been evident for some time, with some final effects for such Disney Plus series as WandaVision and She-Hulk Attorney at Law inserted after their streaming debuts. But ultimately, why was that happening? It was happening because Marvel was too busy trying to crank out too much content, but even more importantly than that, Marvel was not actually engaging in good planning in the pre-production phases like we talked about before. Marvel and Disney in general, it seems in the past several years, have moved to a shoot everything and fix it in post kind of attitude. Whereas you see other movies from other studios have a lot more pre-planning in the pre-production phases that not only simplifies the entire production process, but it makes it far less costly as well. People keep asking, how is it that Disney spends so much money making the movies they do, whereas other studios who make similar films spend so much less? That right there. That's why. Some internal sources suggest Alonzo was a scapegoat, and point to the She-Hulk VFX issues as a symptom of a deeper rot, namely a lack of oversight in script development. In the original arc of She-Hulk, the flashback of star Tatiana Maslany's transformation into her Hulk character didn't take place until episode 8. And this is where things start getting ugly, folks. The so-called bad VFX that we see was because of half-baked scripts, says one person involved with She-Hulk. That's not Victoria, that's Kevin Feige. And even above Kevin, those issues should be addressed in pre-production. The timeline is not allowing the Marvel executives to sit with the material. Amen. For all the faults and problems with Victoria Alonso, who deserves to be gone, at the end of the day, it's still Kevin Feige's responsibility, and he's the one screwing things up from the get-go. All the while, Marvel was bleeding money with a single episode of She-Hulk costing some $25 million. And hey, what have we been telling you? These shows are costing way too much, just like Ahsoka. They are not getting the return for what they're putting in to the production of these things when they're spending this much money. That dwarfed the budget of the final season episode of HBO's Game of Thrones, but without a similar zeitgeist bang. The August 2022 series premiered at the El Capitan Theater, 
foreshadowed what was to come six months later at the Quantumania Bow. The She-Hulk special effects were out of focus in multiple scenes. There are signs that the flood of Marvel product is leading people to tune out. Quote, I'm not prepared to call it a permanent fall, but based on the numbers that go with Marvel podcasts, Marvel-based articles, friends who do Marvel-based video coverage, all of these numbers are significantly down, says Jonah Robinson, co-author of the New York Times bestseller MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios, who is a writer and podcaster at The Ringer. Quote, the quality is suffering. In 2019, at the peak, if you put Marvel Studios in front of something, people were like, oh, that brand means quality. That association is no longer the case because there have been so many projects that felt half-baked and undercooked. Exactly. If you put Marvel Studios in front of, say, hmm, Captain Marvel in 2019, anything hits. Or how about some of the problems with future endeavors like Blade? This thing has been trying to get started for the last several years and still nothing to this point. As public criticism mounts, Feige is pulling the plug on scripts and projects that aren't working. Case in point, the Blade reboot. Marshala Ali signed on for the eponymous role of a vampire. Things look promising for a 2023 release, but the project has gone through at least five writers, two directors, one shut down six weeks before production. One person familiar with the script permutations says the story at one point morphed into a narrative led by women and filled with life lessons. Put a chicken in it and make a name it gay! Yeah, I mean, South Park was dead on right. Blade was relegated to the fourth lead, a bizarre idea considering the studio had two-time Oscar winner Ali on board. But amid reports that Ali was ready to exit, Feige went back to the drawing board and hired Michael Green, who did Logan a few years ago. Speculation around town as the studio is looking to make the film this time but now slated for 2025, and here's the key, on a budget of less than $100 million, a deviation from Marvel's big spending strategy. And you'll remember, we've talked about this a lot. A few months ago, Bob Iger seemed very adamant about reining in the budgets of particularly studios like Marvel when it came to not only the number of pieces of content that they would release, but the actual budgets for each of those pieces of content themselves. With Iger publicly acknowledging the downside of a Marvel TV glut that diluted focus and attention, the keepers of the comic book empire are considering some dramatic moves. Sources say there have been talks to bring back the original gang for an Avengers movie. This would include reviving Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man, Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow, both of whom who were killed off in Endgame. If you were able to bring those actors back, it wouldn't come cheap. Sources say Robert Downey Jr.'s upfront salary for Iron Man 3 was around $25 million. It would be a cheap trick indeed to try to do that, but maybe Disney is really that desperate at this point, and Robert Downey Jr. is going to cost a lot more than $25 million. It was rumored that he walked away with $75 to $100 million in that range just for Infinity War and Endgame. So if they wanted to get him back at this point, they're probably looking at something around the same range. And just stop and think about that for a minute. They just said that they were going to spend under $100 million to do a Blade film. That same cost that it would take to make the Blade film at that budget level is about what Disney would have to pay just to have Robert Downey Jr. walk on the set. In conclusion, the article states, The key to reinvigorating Marvel may lie with the superhero arsenal that Disney acquired during its 2019 purchase of 21st Century Fox, that deal brought several blue-chip heroes such as the X-Men and the Fantastic Four back under the studio's control. Already fans are geeking out about next year's Deadpool 3, which unites Ryan Reynolds' Merc with a mouth with Hugh Jackman's Wolverine and a reboot of Fantastic Four slated for 25. As a bonus, the Fox editions give Feige an opportunity to reimagine the X-Men franchise. Writing the Marvel obituary would be ill-advised, says Jason Squire, professor emeritus at USC School of Cinematic Arts and the host of the Movie Business Podcast. Quote, Kevin Feige is the Babe Ruth of movie executives, and Marvel has the most profitable track record in movie history. No question. And I want to remind everybody of this article from the Wall Street Journal from April of this year, 2023. Ike Perlmutter, the former owner and former internal chairman of Marvel once he sold it to Disney for $4 billion says, Disney fired me from Marvel. I wasn't laid off. As you may recall, Disney tried to conceal Ike Perlmutter's dismissal in the guise of cost cutting earlier this year when Bob Iger had announced that there would be $5.5 billion of capital expenditure reductions or cuts at the Walt Disney Company in a variety of areas. 
but most of it was going to come from studios and production and things like that. Ike Perlmutter's job was jettisoned out the door as part of that, but we all knew that was not really the truth. But in reality, Ike Perlmutter was fired from Disney for the temerity of just going against Bob Iger's grain. When Ike Perlmutter sold Marvel, the entire Marvel empire, to Disney back in 2009, it came with himself and Kevin Feige and many others. They already had an MCU relatively well mapped out for several years, thanks to people like Jon Favreau working with guys like Kevin Feige. But one of the things that became clear over time is that there was a rift between Kevin Feige and Ike Perlmutter. Kevin Feige wanted to do things differently, whereas Ike Perlmutter was a very cost-conscious individual, saying that the amount of money that was being spent to produce these Marvel films was just getting too out of hand. There wasn't enough pre-planning being done. There weren't enough things being put together to do things wisely so that they didn't have to spend $200 and $250 million to make a cinematic event. Ike Perlmutter also wanted to stick with the highest tier, most well-known Marvel characters, where it's Kevin Feige wanted to diverge off into a different road, as it were, especially after Endgame. Well, lo and behold, in 2015, they managed to remove Ike Perlmutter from the top most powerful position at Marvel. Kevin Feige convinced Bob Iger to basically sideline Ike Perlmutter, and Victoria Alonso played a big part in that as well. Ike Perlmutter was then given dominion over Marvel Comics, but of course, he didn't have much creative direction over those comics, as people have often joked about in the last several years of what Marvel Comics has produced. So what's important to understand is that up through Infinity War and Endgame, you had somebody like Ike Perlmutter in there, and you had the original architecture of, say, Jon Favreau still working inside the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Everything after that point, everything that would have been put into pre-production and planning in 2015 and beyond, well, that's the stuff that you're seeing now in Marvel Phases 4 and 5. Now, to be fair, Ike Perlmutter didn't think that Black Panther was going to be as big of a hit as it was. That was one of the things that Kevin Feige wanted to push for. But what made Black Panther successful is that the character was very well introduced in Captain America Civil War, a movie that most everybody really enjoyed. That set his solo film that led into Infinity War up for big success, and also leading in just a few months before Infinity War came out helped as well. Captain Marvel was a purely Kevin Feige decision as well. Now, of course, that also made a billion dollars at the box office, but like we stated earlier, short of that being two months before Endgame, it wouldn't have made half that. The point is, is that these are the type of characters that Kevin Feige bet the farm on for phases four and five in Marvel, and we can see the results. The box office has basically collapsed from the early phases of Marvel, especially once you adjust for ticket price inflation. They've lost over 50% of their total audience, probably in some cases approaching 60 or 70%. People have checked out of the MCU, and it's not necessarily for an issue of an overglut of product. Yeah, I can understand that argument, but if the product was actually of a higher quality, and not just in the sense of VFX, but in the writing, in the intrigue as well, well, I don't think they'd have these problems. Ultimately, this entire Marvel mess boils down to Kevin Feige. He is responsible for running that studio. He is supposed to be a creative studio director. He is the guy who is now solely in charge of the architecture of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He has been for the last several years. Phases four and five, that's all on him. He's supposed to be the one overseeing things like the writing, the directing, the post-production. All of this should be well mapped out. But what we're seeing now is Kevin Feige unchained. Kevin Feige left to his own devices. This is the mess that is out there. And certainly higher up at Disney are to blame as well. Folks in the C-suite, folks like Alan Bergman, who are perhaps throwing too much at Marvel at one time, and Kevin Feige just can't handle it. But Marvel's biggest problem at the end of the day is still that it's relying on B, C, and D tier level characters that nobody knows or cares about that aren't at all very charismatic and the stories just aren't keeping people interested. Disney has taken a very successful, very expensive franchise that they bought, paid $4 billion for to entertain the boys out there and have now made the entire universe full of boring female superheroes that frankly, not even the girls want to go see. 
Disney and Kevin Feige have a lot to fix on their hands. And quite frankly, I don't think they're capable of doing it. And even if they can somehow magically pull Marvel out of the trash can, it is going to be years before they see any type of major financial shifting of the winds. They can bring in the X-Men. They can bring in the Fantastic Four. The audience just won't care anymore. Make sure you're subscribed to Valiant Renegade and join us every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern for the live show.